Test. Test. Okay. Um, all right. Here we go. Ta ta. All right. Thank you. Uh, it's my deep honor and distinct pleasure to be introducing uh, my dear friend, my role model, and my karmic brother, Matthew David Seagal. Seagal. <laughs> um, Seagal. Yeah. Um, as long as you spell it right. Yeah. <laughs> I, which I had nothing to do with. <laughs> so. um, Matt's one of the only people uh, around my age that I actually see as a true philosopher. Um, not only does he have an uncanny ability to subsume and convey ideas with absolute crystal clarity, if I ever want to know more about any particular idea. Matt's usually the person I go to. Not only can I get the gist of it very well, but I can zoom in and just get nitpicky about it and really <laughs> inform myself on the bells and whistles of things. Um, <laughs> and Matt's also just a great example of uh, how to show up in community. I just see that in him all the time. Uh, how much he shows up, how much he really carries and doesn't call a lot of attention to himself. He's pretty humble about it. Um, and as many of you know, and some of you may not know, he blogs regularly at footnotes to Plato.com. I highly recommend checking it out. You'll learn something new and probably think some brand new thoughts, which is really saying something. So without further ado, Matt Siegel. Did I break it? Okay. Well. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks for sticking around all afternoon and uh, staying strong with us through all these really interesting talks. Um, I kind of wish I could have gone later in the week because I've just noticed in the last two days how much all the other talks, starting with Rick's and then Theo's and Jahan's and Travis's and Jessica's, like, are setting the ground for a lot of what I want to say, so my task is a lot easier than it would have been. And I imagine if I had waited till Thursday to go, it would have been even, even easier. It's really fascinating and humbling to see how much we're all on the same page and hopefully I'll try to point out the resonances as I go along here with everyone else's presentations. So the title here is um, Evolutionary Panpsychism or Eliminative Materialism and this, this uh, title comes from um, the chapter of a uh, the, the title of a chapter in a book by um, a philosopher and media theorist named Stephen Shaviro, and he's part of this philosophical movement, um, you could call it, that just emerged in the last several years called speculative realism, and he's sort of throwing Whitehead's hat uh, into the arena of discussion. Speculative realism is a very diverse community of thinkers. I'll, I'll explain what they share in a minute, but Shaviro's really carrying the Whiteheadian torch and saying that um, we need to pay attention uh, to this man's ideas. He was ahead of his time, and he can help us imagine the way forward into a more ecological civilization. Um, the subtitle, then, is Towards an Anthro-Decentric Philosophy of Nature. And so this word anthro-decentrism has to do with getting over anthropocentrism, decentering the human. And that's really where all of the speculative realists, whether it's Shaviro and others that I'll mention and get into more as this talk goes along, like Graham Harmon and uh, Ray Brassier, uh, Ian Hamilton Grant, they all want to decenter the human. They all want to critique um, what they call philosophies of human access which really began with Kant, where the whole issue for philosophy became more epistemological and everyone focused after Kant on how human beings have access to reality. And that developed into phenomenology as the dominant school of at least, trans uh, of at least uh, continental philosophy, where the questions you know, in phenomenology are all about how the world appears to a human. Um, and it's, it's uh, very anthropocentric at the end of the day, even if there's this acknowledgement that there's a wider natural world we still don't allow ourselves to say anything about it. So these philosophies of human access are very limited to what human beings can have access to, and they ignore the world of 
what Harmon calls objects, and by that he just means non-human things that exist for their own sake. They're, they have their own experiences, their own ways of valuing reality, but philosophies of human access don't, don't permit us to even speculate about what those realities might be like. So just quickly from Harmon, he says, by coming to terms with an increasing range of objects, humans do not become nihilistic princes of darkness, but actually the most sincere creatures the earth has ever seen. Um, so what I'm trying to do here is accept the fact that we need to decenter the human, and I'll show the various reasons drawing on Freud as Travis did, these three major crises in the image of the human being, starting with Copernicus, Darwin, and then Freud. Um, we need to accept that the human being is being decentered uh, in our attempts to construct a new cosmology. Um, so I think Whitehead provides us, and, and panpsychism more generally provides us with a great way of doing that, and at the same time, time avoiding nihilism or a kind of illuminative materialism. We can decenter the human and still live in an enchanted universe. In fact, I think that's the only way we can re-enchant the universe is by decentering the human. Okay, let's get beyond the title. That took longer than I was hoping. Um, so I'm going to try to give a little cartoon history of the of modernity. Um, starting with uh, the, Copernican, the Copernican revolution, right? The, the cosmological decentering um, of the human being. Um, you know, Copernicus articulated the heliocentric model of the solar system and um, the great chain of being, the crystalline spheres of, of the medieval cosmos were, were shattered, destroyed. Um, the Earth was now adrift in a universe that we weren't really sure how big it was or uh, where it came from. Um, and as Nietzsche put it, since Copernicus, humani humanity has been rolling from the center towards X, towards the unknown. Um, we no longer have uh, a, a, an obvious um, point of central reference or orientation. Now we're adrift in space. Um, and what's significant about this Nietzsche quote is this using this, this notion of the X, the towards X, towards the unknown, I think he's, he's ref referencing Kant, um, who would refer to his, uh, he would refer to the thing in itself, or this noumenal domain, and oppose that to a phenomenal domain, and he would often say the thing in itself equals X, as in all we can know about it is, is that it exists, we can't say anything more about it than that it exists, than that there is this realm beyond what human beings can know and access. Um, and I'm, I'm calling Kant, uh, I'm referring to his achievement as a kind of an interval that preserved for a time or protected as, a, an, an, as, as a, he achieved a sort of compromise um, that allowed the human being to remain at the center. Usually, I mean, Kant referred to his own philosophical um, accomplishment as a Copernican revolution in philosophy in that, you know, if, if Copernicus decentered the earth and by proxy the human, um, Kant, in a way, tried to recenter the human by making, you know, the objects that we think are out there, um, making it, uh, making it clear that actually the way those objects appear is determined by our subjectivity. So he recentered the subject after the decentering of Copernicus. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that we should call Kant's revolution a Copernican revolution. It's more of a Ptolemaic reaction. It's an attempt to preserve human centrality on a metaphysical plane, even if in terms of the physical universe, it's clear we're not at the center anymore. So this is the, Copern the, the Kantian interval in the way that we talk about a petroleum interval. It's like it's a, an attempt to compromise, to buy some time, new things become possible, but it's not gonna last, <laughs> right? Because this guy, Darwin, um, came after Kant and revealed this story of biological evolution. Now Kant um, famously said that there would never be a Newton of the grass blade. In other words, there would never be a mechanistic explanation for life in the way that Newton and the other uh, originators of the scientific revolution were able to account for the physical world in terms of these mechanisms, these mathematical formulas. Kant didn't think we could do the same thing with life, with living organisms. And many people suggests that, well, if Kant had lived another 50 years or so, he would have had to admit that Darwin, in fact, came up with this explanation. 
on Newto based on Newtonian principles, mechanistic, purposeless principles that explained how life as it appears before us differentiated into all these various species that seem to fit in a purposeful way into their environments. And in fact, there's a mechanism that can account for how that could all happen in a blind way. That's the story, at least, um, of this further decentering of the human. Rather than being the crown of creation, where a, a twig at the edge of this huge bush of evolutionary creativity. And notice um, these various mass extinction events, right? Cambrian explosion 600 million years ago, and then mass extinction, mass extinction, mass extinction, five mass extinctions. And now, you know, we're on this outer rim here. So this is the center here is, is the four billion, four billion years ago, the origin of life roughly, and then moving along in both directions here, right? So that it's not just a unilinear sort of progression. Bacteria emerge first, and then it branches out into all this diversity, more like a bush than a than a linear tree or something. So human beings, you know, we're over here. Many of the other species of, um, yeah. you see this? Many of the other species um, went extinct of, of, of our homo genus, right? So we survived. But now there's another mass extinction happening. So this thing that Kant tried to argue for, that the mind provides the sort of transcendental condition for how nature can appear to us, that starts to seem a little silly you know, putting mind first and nature is just an appearance to mind. It starts to seem a little silly when you recognize this vast evolutionary history and that in fact nature has priority over mind. Mind emerged, the human mind emerged out of nature billions of years after life began. So this whole Kantian compromise doesn't seem to work anymore after Darwin. And then of course the final nail in the coffin of anthropocentrism is Freud, um, who doesn't seem to want to stay on the screen very long. Uh, who revealed that, you know, if Copernicus decentered us in the cosmos and Darwin decentered us on the earth and in the biosphere, Freud decentered us within our own psyche. The ego was no longer the master of its own house. Um, civilization, Freud said, is uh, the result of a primal trauma and that we've repressed that trauma and um, all of our rationality is uh, an attempt to ultimately repress our, our primal libidinal instincts and that there is no ultimate healing from that unless we want to become animals again. So there was no, for Freud, there was no expression of libido that could be um, civilized in a way that would make room for, you know, genuine, un alienated, non-narcissistic, non-neurotic um, uh, consciousness. If we're civilized, we're going to be neurotic, we're going to have psychosis, it's just the way it is, and we can try to cope with that. Um, but again, the ego then, not only is the human decentered in the biosphere like Darwin suggested, but the ego within the human psyche is now also decentered. So I think after these various decenterings of the human, we're faced with this, you know, we, we've arrived at a crossroads. We're faced with this sort of decision. Um, either the root of evolutionary panpsychism on the one hand, or the other root of eliminative materialism on the other hand. Um, I'm going to start with eliminative materialism and introduce some thinkers that call themselves that first, because, you know, as uh, Colin McGinn, a, a famous philosopher nowadays who does a lot of reviews in the New York Re Review of Books put it, uh, he said that there's something vaguely hippie-ish about panpsychism, um, something almost stoned about it. And I think, I think he's actually onto something there. So I'm going to start with eliminative materialism. If you need to go outside, if smoke them if you got them, come back, you'll understand panpsychism <laughs> a little bit better after that. So this crossroads is important, right? What, what philosophy, what worldview we choose to articulate um, this anthrodecentric future that we cannot escape is important because as Whitehead says, a philosophical outlook is the very foundation of thought and of life. The sort of ideas we attend to and the sort of ideas which we push into the negligible background govern our hopes, our fears, our control of behavior. As we think, we live. As we think, we live. This is why the assemblage of philosophic ideas is more than a specialist study. It molds our very type of civilization. 
So the eliminativists, uh, not an exhaust exhaustive list here, but just a couple of contemporary, well, besides Democritus, the atomist, uh, who thought that all more complex arrangements of atoms were just um, sort of ephemeral emergences, but ultimately the final explanation had to be in terms of atoms, right? So he's like the first eliminativist. That's Thomas Metzinger. He's a cognitive scientist. That's Ray Brassier. He's a nihilist philosopher who I'll get more into in a moment. That's Daniel Dennett, philosopher of mind. And they, this is the dream team, Paul and Patricia Churchland, um, neurophilosophers. Metzinger wrote that book, Being No One, which he basically says that he's kind of a neuro-idealist in a strange way, though he wouldn't describe himself like that. He says all of our experience as human beings is a model constructed for us by our brains. All of our experience of the outside world is a, is a model constructed by the brain, and our experience of ourselves, self-consciousness, is just a model of the model. Right? The prefrontal cortex and some other systems create a model of our internal model of reality, and so ultimately we're living in a kind of matrix, right? Um, but then he just assumes this materialistic background, but provides no way of any scientist gaining access to that through their own experience, right? So it's a weird, there's a lot of paradoxes with these eliminativists that I'm still working through. Ray Brasse's book, Nihil Unbound, um, which I'll get into more in a moment, where he's championing nihilism and disenchantment as an intellectually um, important discovery that we need to run with that and not shy away from just being nihilists. Um, and we'll, I'll get more into him in a second. Consciousness Explained by Daniel Dennett, where he tries to argue that our felt experience of qualia or the way things appear to us, the sensations, pains, colors, and so on, that that's, they don't actually exist. They're just words that, and, and language games that we've evolved to play with each other and that ultimately none of it exists. Again, this is very strange, right? Um, <laughs> Paul Churchland, Matter and Consciousness, Patricia Churchland, her new book, Touching a Nerve. Um, they're suggesting that in the future, when science continues its march of discovery and understanding of the brain, that we won't talk in terms of love and insecurity and anxiety. We'll talk in terms of neurochemicals and, and neurological systems and so on. 15, okay. Um, so one path that eliminativism could lead us towards is a form of transhumanism and <laughs> This is where, instead of imagining nature as in some sense ensouled, we imagine the human as in some sense machine-like, and we search for immor immortality, like um, Kurzweil wants us to do with his new, um, you know, he works for Google now on this immortality project to try to find a way to upload human consciousness into the internet so that we can live forever in a disincarnate form of pure information. Um, and the one thing about transhumanism is it's, uh, it has this very sort of dark uh, image of our human future. When we're no longer human anymore, we're, we're more like machines again. And it's, they have this perverted understanding of Teilhard de Chardin, I think a technozoic interpretation of Teilhard de Chardin. You know, and look at that image and then read this quote, the history of the living world can be reduced to this, the elaboration of ever more perfect eyes at the heart of a cosmos where it is always possible to discern more. You know, I wonder if that's what Tehard was talking about. <laughs> so that's the technozoic Tehard. There's an ecozoic Tehard that I think would be troubled by that. So here's Ray Brassier, one of the eliminative materialists and also this, one of the speculative realists. And he says, you know, curved space time, the periodic table, natural selection, none of these are comprehensible in narrative terms. Galaxies, molecules, organisms, they're not for anything, right? Um, that's, what I, that's what I think of him. Um, and then he says, the disenchantment of the world is a necessary consequence of the coruscating potency, the brilliant potency of reason, and hence an invigorating vector of intellectual discovery rather than a calamitous diminishment. Uh-oh. Keynote quit unexpectedly. We cannot rely on technology, people. The transhumanism. <laughs> Ideas. <laughs> Down yourself on, download yourself onto this computer and then it crashes and <laughs> you're erased. Um, so disenchantment deserves to be celebrated as an achievement of intellectual maturity, not bewailed as a debilitating impoverishment. Reality is indifferent to our existence and oblivious to the values and meanings which we would drape over it. 
in order to make it more hospitable. Philosophy should be more than a sop to the pathetic twinge of human self-esteem. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking has interests that do not coincide with those of living. Thinking has interests that do not coincide with those of living. Brasse articulates what he calls a logic of extinction. And he relates this to our knowledge of biological evolution. 99 or 97, somewhere in between there, percent of species that have ever existed have gone extinct. Human beings will go, even if we have this great flowering of an integral culture and an ecozoic, we'll, we're going to go extinct eventually. That's just what happens with life. And so Brassier dwells on that fact, articulates this logic of extinction, and says, to do philosophy, to think in a philosophic way, is to think, not just as Socrates says, as, as an attempt to learn to die, but to, to realize that one is already dead, that one does not exist, that one sense of self as a, an autonomous, egoic, free agent is an illusion. He thinks science has proven this. So we are just brains living out this fantasy world um, where we can interact morally and, and have purposes and values and so on. And I want to, instead of just dismissing this, I want to kind of live into this to, to try to um, imagine what it would be like to follow Brasse's logic of extinction to its, to its ultimate conclusion, right? So just, you know, imagine now that that you're dead. Imagine first, just accept, live into the materialist universe where you are your brain. Now imagine you die, your brain decays. Not only are you dead, you don't even have a memory of being alive anymore if your memory is stored in here, right? So your existence is gone, your memory of even having existed is gone. What happens then? What happens when you blow out the candle of that egoic self-consciousness? I think we actually end up in a rather, you know, this is a Alex Gray painting, a rather pan-psychist universe if we fully live into that eliminativist logic of blowing out our, our ego candle, because as soon as we blow out that candle, we dim the brightness of our own solar modern consciousness and begin to see the candlelights of all the other creatures all around us shining towards us. And we blow out our own candle, we, we begin to inhabit an enchanted, illuminated universe full of other intelligent beings that we, we couldn't notice because our own ego consciousness was so inflated, so bright, that it blinded us to these other uh, centers of consciousness all around us. So Stephen Shavero points out that, uh, contrary to what the eliminativists are saying, it is only an anthropocentric prejudice to assume that things cannot be lively and active and mindful on their own without us. Eliminativist arguments thus start out by presupposing human exceptionalism. So they presuppose that value, meaning, purpose is all somehow produced in the human brain, doesn't exist out there in the world. It's a fluke of evolution that emerged in our species on accident. When our species goes extinct, value, purpose, narrative, all that is also gone, dissolved. But this is already, it's just presupposing human specialness, human uniqueness. And that uh, there's a need to recognize the um, anthropocentric prejudice that that, that implies. Um, so here are the panpsychists, and again this is not an exhaustive list, and using photographs instead of names makes it very obvious that these are all white men. Um, this is Thales, this is Anaxagoras, this is Giordano Bruno, uh, Spinoza, Leibniz, Schopenhauer, Schelling, um, that's um, Haeckel, Ernst Haeckel, the German biologist, that's Fechner, that's Henri Bergson, that's William James, Terre de Chardin, and then contemporary panpsychists, um, that's uh, 